Well, this is a great story, and it's one that has a lot of uh, moving parts in it. And as we go through it this morning, my, my real desire is to help us to see some elements of character that in the lives of both Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. You know, as I was thinking about this and how character is often formed, which is usually in the difficult circumstances of life, I was reminded that diamonds are formed in depths of over 100 miles into the earth, where the pressure uh, of that and over 3,000 degrees of heat take, turns carbon into a diamond. And character is a similar dynamic. It's the heat of life, the pressures, the circumstances, the hardships that actually God works through to develop a Christ-like character. Look what Peter says, 1 Peter 1, 6 to 8. He said, in this, and he's talking about the difficult circumstances, uh, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. God uses or works through the hardships and sufferings in this life, our difficult circumstances, to transform our character and to strengthen our faith. Paul reminds us in Romans 8, he says that we know that in all things, God works for good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image and likeness of his son. I've had the opportunity to speak here a number of times. And one of the things that you often hear me talk about is this transformation process that I actually believe that the goal of the Christian life is to become more and more like Jesus in his character and then to experience his quality of life. And that, that's a process. It's not something that we perfect, but it is something that we can make progress in. Sometimes, though, it's difficult to get an idea of what does that even look like and how does that happen? And I think we see in the lives of uh, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, not only in this particular story, uh, these first 18 verses of chapter 3, but also in the rest of the book that I'm hoping will actually inform us in our own understanding of discipleship, of Christ formation. Paul talks about this very specifically. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Father, who is the Spirit. All of us are in a process of transformation as followers of Christ. And we're going to see in the lives of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz some very specific things, five character traits, if you will, that I believe God desires to form in us as well. So that's what I'd really like to talk to you about this morning. So let's just jump right into it. Characteristic number one of a Christ-like character is what I refer to as godly initiative. Specifically, a Christ-like person recognizes God's leading, and then they proceed in faith. And that's what we see in Naomi in verses 1 to 4. Listen again to what the author says. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, uh, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight I will be winnowing barley, or tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. So what's going on here? Naomi is not taking matters into her own hands because she's becoming impatient. Instead, she's working, I believe, in harmony with God's will and Jewish customs where parents would arrange the marriages for their children. Naomi's getting older. And no doubt she's thinking about what's going to happen to Ruth when she dies. So she takes the initiative as Ruth's mother-in-law to arrange for her future. And don't miss the fact that Naomi does not refer to Boaz here as a kinsman redeemer, but simply as a kinsman of ours, which simply means that Boaz is a relative. And this is an important detail. 
because it shows that Naomi is more concerned about Ruth and her future than she is about the continuation of her own family line. Remember that family, the family name was carried on by the sons, and both of Naomi's sons have died, and she's too old to have another. So her hope for her family line to endure is over, unless Boaz marries Ruth. As a kinsman redeemer, according to Jewish custom, he could marry Ruth, and hopefully they would have a son that would then carry on the family, family name of Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. But ensuring the family name doesn't seem to be Naomi's primary concern, at least not at this point. Instead, she wants Ruth to marry Boaz because he's a good and godly man. Naomi's known Boaz for years. She knows that he's a man of character and integrity and that he, he has the financial means to provide for Ruth for the rest of her life. Naomi is showing more concern for Ruth's welfare than she is for the continuation of her own family line. And that's a big deal, especially in this culture. That's a type of self-sacrifice that is endemic of the essence of love. The kind of love that we as followers of Christ are to exude toward others. That as we, as we receive God's love for us, we essentially become conduits of his love for, for others. Uh, Paul says in Romans 12, 10, to be devoted to one another in brotherly love and to honor one another above yourselves. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, do everything in love. Galatians 5, 13, serve one another in love. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. Over and over and over again, we see that love is the supreme virtue in the Christian life. But not only is Naomi's reference to Boaz here as a kinsman, an indication of Naomi's love and concern for Ruth, it also reveals the fact that Naomi believes that Boaz's presence in their lives is actually an indication of God at work. Naomi knows that Ruth didn't just stumble into Boaz's field by accident. It was God's leading. And so she's proceeding here according to, to her faith and confidence in God. She's trusting that God is working in these circumstances. And that God is leading her to arrange this marriage between Ruth and Boaz. And Naomi knows that this night is the best night for Ruth to propose. Yeah, you heard that right. Ruth is going to propose to Boaz. And just for the record, my wife's not here for this service. She'll be here the next service. For the record, Susan proposed to me. Okay, so just so that you guys know. And... Uh, it's kind of an unusual thing, especially in Jewish culture for this to take place, but that's exactly what's going on. Ruth is going to propose to Boaz, and Naomi is saying, Ruth, tonight's the night. This is the best opportunity you have to pop the question. Why? Because she knows that based upon the progression of the harvest, that Boaz will spend the night sleeping on the threshing floor to protect the grain that they've been harvesting over, over all this time so that he can take it to market the next day. And that this will provide, him being there, will provide her with the perfect opportunity to have a private, uninterrupted conversation. So Naomi proceeds in faith, draws up this plan for Ruth to propose to Boaz. See, friends, Christ-like people recognize the hand of God in a given situation. And then, trusting in God's leading, they just take the next step forward in faith. Naomi believed that God had placed Boaz in their life. It was neither a coincidence nor an accident. It was God's divine intervention. And then, so she proceeds accordingly, taking Christ-like initiative to develop a plan for Ruth to propose to Boaz. And this is a bold plan, totally dependent on God for it to work. In fact, this plan is so risky that if it goes wrong in the slightest way, the entire thing could destroy Ruth's reputation and very likely damage her entire future. So this is a big deal. So let's take a look at it, verses 3 and 4. Naomi says to Ruth, wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Now, two things are happening here. First, 
Naomi wants Ruth to look and smell her best, right? Because that's not a bad thing. But she's also telling Ruth that it's time for you, my daughter, to move from mourning the death of your family to marriage. There is a time to grieve loss, and it's an important time. But there is then a time to live. And we can't live rightly until we grieve rightly. And so grief is a big part of life because life is tragic. But God is faithful. So for Ruth to change her appearance would be actually a signal to Boaz that she was ready. That she was ready to move from mourning into marriage. And then Naomi says, okay, go down to the threshing floor, right? So now, now we're getting the details of the plan. But don't let him know that you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and then he will tell you what to do. Now, if this seems a bit hot and steamy right uh, at this point, it's supposed to. Because the language that the author is using here is suggestive and sexually charged, the Hebrew words that he's using. The threshing floor was the last stage of the harvest where the landowner and his workers who had worked in collecting all the grain would have all the grain in one place. And so it was a time for celebration. So the night before they would take it to market, they would all get together at the threshing floor and they would party pretty hard. They would eat, they would drink. And then uh, very often prostitutes would come to proposition the men because they were in such a good mood. This is, this is a, a, a way of understanding the threshing floor. Throughout the Old Testament, the threshing floor is associated as a place of disrepute. For example, in Hosea 9, chapters, or verses 1 and 2, God actually rebukes Israel for her unfaithfulness at the threshing floor. Hosea says, God, or he says, Do not rejoice, O Israel, and do not be jubilant like the other nations, for you have been unfaithful to your God. You love the wages of a prostitute at every threshing floor. So for Ruth, now just picture this, for Ruth to go to the threshing floor to visit Boaz was risky because her motives could be easily misunderstood. Do you see what's happening here? They could be easily misunderstood. And that's why Naomi tells her, don't let him know that you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. So Naomi instructs Ruth to hide and to wait until Boaz has eaten, knowing that after a hard day's work and a full stomach, he's going to be in a good mood and he'll drift off to sleep. Now, let me be clear. There's no indication in the text here that Boaz was drunk or ever got drunk. Uh, or that he ever responded to the, initiate, the uh, invitation of a prostitute. Instead, the author here, who many think is Samuel, the author is uh, showing us how incredibly risky this plan is and how dependent upon the Lord Ruth and Naomi are for this thing to work because it could blow up in a nanosecond. This is a really big deal. One wrong assumption on Boaz's part, and it's over. And then Naomi says in verse 4, when he lies down, note the place where he is laying. Uh, the threshing floor, because everybody was there, right, all the workers and everybody's there, was a pretty public place, and no doubt Boaz would not be alone. But it would be dark, and so Naomi knows that Boaz will spend the night by his pile of grain to make sure nobody comes and steals it, because that's often what would happen, right? Bandits would come in if they've collected all the grain, and they would steal the grain before it could get taken to market. And so the reason that Naomi wants Ruth to note where he lies down is so she doesn't approach the wrong man. That would blow everything, right? I mean, can you imagine? So Naomi wants Ruth to be very careful because approaching anyone else but Boaz would be disastrous. They could easily, he could easily misunderstand her intentions. And then Naomi tells Ruth to uncover his feet and lie down, and then he'll tell you what to do. Now, yes, that seems weird and does seem very suggestive. In fact, the Hebrew word here for uncover occurs primarily in the Old Testament to describe illicit sexual relations and to uncover one's feet was a euphemism for sexual organs. So again, clearly the author of Ruth 
is using sexually charged language to show us how volatile this situation is and creates the question as to whether or not Ruth and Boaz are going to escape this with their integrity intact. So this is what you would call a, a uh, Old Testament cliffhanger. Okay, so what's really going on? Well, I'm not exactly sure about the uncovering the feet thing because it's an unusual custom that we don't have a lot of information on. But I can tell you for certain what's not going on. And that is, there's no hanky-panky going on. That ain't happening. Ruth and Boaz are known in the community as two people that are godly and honorable. And there is no way that Boaz would take advantage of Ruth. And frankly, there's no way that if he tried, Ruth would even let him. Uh, so most likely, the reason that Naomi has Ruth and cover Boaz's feet is because she knew that as the night grew, grew colder, his bare feet would get uncomfortable and it would wake him up. And then they could talk quietly and freely. But again, this whole plan can blow up, right? So because Boaz could wake up and misunderstand Ruth's presence and intention, he could accuse her of being a prostitute and then the whole thing's over. It would ruin her reputation. She's done. But again... Naomi believed that God was at work here. Friends, when we are in a situation where we believe that God is at work, he is usually going to only show us the next step. He doesn't give us an LED flashlight that will illuminate the next hundred yards. He'll give us a candle, and the candle gives us enough light to take the next step. And then when we take that step in faith, then he gives us enough revelation to take the next step in faith. And then after that, the next. And that's exactly what's going on here. And so what we're seeing in Naomi's life is this willingness to trust God in this very perilous situation to keep trusting God for the next right thing, for the next step. It's a risky plan, but she takes the initiative and she proceeds in faith. Which takes us to the next characteristic of a Christ-like person that we see modeled by both Naomi and Ruth. And that is courageous faith. Courageous faith. A Christ-like person places their full confidence in God. And that takes courage. After Naomi lays out the plan, Ruth answers by saying in verse 5, I'll do whatever you say. And so she went down to the threshing floor and did everything that her mother-in-law told her to do. Ruth trusts Naomi and the Lord and submits herself completely to this entire plan. Now, I'm sure that Ruth was uh, very aware of the risks, that this is pretty much an all-or-nothing deal, and yet she offers no resistance. She asks no questions. She's a woman of courageous, just courageous and trusting faith. Now, we've seen this in Ruth up to this point. In chapter 1, Ruth leaves. We see her faith when she leaves her home and her family and commits herself to Naomi and the Lord. In chapter 2... Uh, we see her faith when she sets out to glean in the fields, trusting that the Lord would lead her to someone who would show her favor. And then here in chapter 3, we see her fully submitting herself to this bold and risky plan. Ruth is a godly woman with courageous faith and had complete confidence in the Lord, trusting that he would work out all the details. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's something that we see uh, her example of. Paul reminds us in Romans 8 31 that if God is for us, who can be against us? And so Ruth was trusting that. As God's people, we can trust that He is working everything out for our good and for His glory. Every circumstance, every situation, He is working out for our good and His glory. And you may be in a circumstance right now where it sure doesn't feel that way but he's working behind the scenes, just like he's working in this situation. So Ruth goes down to the threshing floor under the cover of darkness and hides out, and then look what happens. Verse 7. When Boaz had, when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was, in a good, and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Now, notice that Boaz is in a good mood. Naomi was counting on that. He goes over and he lies down at the far end of the grain pile. Again, this is no coincidence, right? This is part of God's work, part of God's divine plan. Boaz could have slept anywhere on the threshing floor, and yet he just chooses randomly, by accident, 
by coincidence to go to the far end of the threshing floor where he and Ruth could have a private conversation at some point in the evening. So Ruth approaches quietly. She uncovers his feet and she lays down, just like Naomi told her to do. Verse 8, in the middle of the night, something startled the man and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Probably what startled him is that his feet are uncovered, so they're getting cold. So he wakes up, he senses a presence there, and the presence of a person on the threshing floor was usually either a bandit trying to come steal what, you're, what you have, or a prostitute who wants to proposition you, right? So either way, it's not a good situation. So Boaz, no doubt, was prepared to either fight or to run. But instead, we see him model this third characteristic of Christ-like character, and that is loving kindness. Loving kindness. A Christ-like person is kind and loving towards other people. Verse 9, who are you, he asks. I am your servant, Ruth, uh, Ruth said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. Ruth doesn't waste any time, does she, to get to the point. That phrase, spread the corner of your garment over me, is, is her way of asking him to marry her. That's the proposal right there. And so we see that in a couple different places in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 16.8, Deuteronomy 23.1, Malachi 2.16, and other places like that. But Ruth was also suggesting that Boaz become the answer to his own prayer. Remember back in chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz said this to Ruth, May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings that you have come to take refuge. The word uh, that Ruth used for spread triggered a clever association with the word that Boaz had used back in chapter 2 for wings. In essence, Ruth was asking Boaz to be the one through whom the Lord would protect her under his wings and reward her for her faithfulness. So do you, do you see what the author is doing here? He's working out this, this plan, showing us the sovereignty of God in all of these different circumstances. And God is doing the same in your life. He's doing the same in mine. And he just wants us to trust him and to just take that next step of faith. And then we see Ruth's loving kindness towards Naomi when she doesn't refer to Boaz simply as a kinsman, a relative, but here as a kinsman redeemer. And Boaz knows exactly what Ruth is asking him. Verse 10, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than what you showed earlier. The earlier kindness that he's referring to is when Ruth left her family back in chapter 1 to take care of Naomi, and the greater kindness now that he is referring to is that Ruth is asking Boaz to marry her because it'll keep Naomi's family line intact if they marry and have a son. Naomi's family will not be blotted out. But Boaz also recognizes that Ruth is showing him personally a loving kindness as well, when he says, you have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. See, apparently, Ruth, or Boaz believed that Ruth could have her pick of husbands, that she was kind of the most eligible uh, widow in the whole area. But she chooses him, an older guy. Ronald Hubbard, in his commentary on Ruth, says she could have married for love or money, but she chose family loyalty instead. Ruth acted neither from passion nor greed, rather sacrificially setting aside personal preference. She chose a marriage of benefit to her family. She reckoned her own happiness as secondary to provision of an heir for her late husband and Naomi. Unbelievable sacrifice on her part. Ruth's decision to marry Boaz as a kinsman redeemer was in keeping with the highest virtues of loving kindness and sacrifice. Uh, and these are evident and to be evident in the lives of every follower of Christ. Of course, Jesus modeled that for us, right? When he went to the cross, taking on the form of a servant, dying in our place to pay the price for our sin. 
And so by Ruth setting aside her own desire for those of her family is in keeping with the highest example of love demonstrated by Jesus himself. But it wasn't only Ruth in whom we see this example. We also see it in Boaz. Uh, Look at verse 11. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I'll do uh, for you all that you ask, and all my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Boaz fully understands Ruth's intentions in coming to him at the threshing floor under the cover of darkness. It wasn't to proposition him, but it was to ask him if he would fulfill his role as a kinsman redeemer. And it's very likely that she went at night because if he refused her, the whole town wouldn't know about it. Because for a kinsman redeemer to refuse his obligation to his family would be shameful. So she's actually looking out for Boaz here. She's giving him an out. You know, so under the cover of darkness, if he refuses me, nobody's going to know that I was here. So he's not going to experience any shame from the community for saying no to me. There's all this self-deference going on. Do you see it? All of this willingness to sacrifice for one another coming out of this richness of, of a Christ-like character. And then Boaz assures Ruth that he will do everything that she asks of him. But then the story takes a twist. We can't celebrate yet, right? Just when we thought that they're going to ride off into the sunset and everything's going to be great, our hopes are interrupted by this shocking revelation uh, that there's somebody else, that, that there's somebody else that Boaz has to defer to. And that takes us to the fourth characteristic, which is uh, of a Christ-like person, which is personal integrity. A Christ-like person demonstrates integrity in everything, in all things. Look at verses uh, 12 to 15. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman and redeemer nearer than I. So stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he's not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. So lie here until morning. And so she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. And we know why he didn't want that to be said, because it it could be misunderstood. He also said, bring me the shawl that you are wearing and hold it out. And when she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. And then he went back to town. Boaz is modeling unbelievable integrity here. Uh, in four primary ways. First, he knows that there's another kinsman redeemer closer than himself in the family line. Israelite tradition dictated that the duty of a kinsman redeemer was the responsibility of the closest relative who was next in line to the deceased person. In this case, that would be Elimelech, which was Ruth's uh, father-in-law. So if Boaz were essentially the second cousin... Uh, he knew that there was a first cousin that would essentially have first right of refusal. And so he was going to defer to that. Even though he wanted to marry Ruth, he was going to defer to that. It's very like, that's very likely why Boaz didn't propose in the first place, because it wasn't his place to do that. His integrity prevented him from doing something that was out of order with their tradition. Second, we see Boaz's integrity in that he tells Ruth to stay here for the night, to sleep there on the uh, threshing floor next to him. But the Hebrew word that is used here, that Boaz uses here, has no heat to it. There's no sexual connotations uh, to it at all. It's simply the word for lodge. Ruth, lodge here for the night. You'll be safe here. So there's this signal that the author gives to us as the readers that there's nothing improper going on in his mind and that nothing sexual is going to happen. Third, we see Boaz's integrity in that he promised if the the, uh, first kinsman redeemer would not fulfill his duty, then Boaz would. And he sealed his promise with a vow when he said, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. So he was making a vow to her. If the first cousin doesn't, then I'll do it for you. So do you see here even how Boaz is trusting the Lord in all this? Right? I mean, let's just be honest. Ruth is hot, and she's eligible. And this, this second cousin, you know, this first cousin 
is probably going to want to scoop her up. And so Boaz, as an older guy, he's never going to get somebody like Ruth ever again. And so now he's losing his opportunity. This is a prime situation, friends, for somebody to take matters into their own hands, to kind of cut corners a little bit, you know, fudge the truth a little bit, try to control the outcome a little bit, but Boaz doesn't do that. He trusts God. And then fourth, we see Boaz's integrity in that he protected Ruth's reputation. I love this. That's what's going on when he fills her shawl up with grain. He wants it to appear like she was gleaning in the field all night, collecting this grain, so that when morning came, she would have something to take home to her family. So that it didn't look like she was doing anything improper. Boaz has just got this impeccable integrity. He doesn't form a scheme to subvert Jewish customs, but he promises to get the ball rolling so that Ruth gets a husband, and then he protects her reputation by making it look like she was gleaning all night so that the town gossips wouldn't have something to talk about. And oh, trust me, there's lots of town gossips, right? They're in everybody's business. They know everything that's going on, even if it's nighttime. But that just kind of leaves us hanging here. Because now we don't know who's going to marry Ruth, right? I mean, we're all cheering for Boaz, but we don't know if he's going to be the guy or if it's going to be the first cousin. You know, just when we were kind of ready to kind of close the deal here, it, we get this kind of other thing happening. But then we see a fifth characteristic of Christ-like character from Naomi and Ruth. So this just keeps going back and forth, right? Back and forth, back and forth. And that is patience. This may be the hardest one. At least it is for me. A Christ-like person is willing to wait upon the Lord. Waiting might be the most difficult act of faith that we can exhibit. You know, and sometimes it feels like waiting is just being passive. But I don't think it's passive at all. I think it requires incredibly active faith to wait upon the Lord. Look at verse 16. When Ruth comes to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she asks, hey, how did it go, right? She, like, wants to know. And then she told her everything, but what that Boaz had done for her, and added, he gave me these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. I love that phrase. You wait. This guy's hot to trot. He's going to get this done. He's got the ball rolling, and he's not going to rest until it's done. So Naomi knows that they have done, at this point, everything that is in their power to do. And now they have to wait. Now they have to just put all of this on the Lord to see what happens next. Everybody's sitting on the edge of their seat here. You know, and very often, man, as I said, this is so hard because we get something in our heads that we think should play out in a certain way. And then we become resistant to it playing out in any other way, even if it's the Lord's will. And then we take matters into our own hands. And then it just gets so messy and difficult and hard. I've done that far too many times. I've learned, there's been seasons in my life, so I've walked with Jesus for 47 years. And there's been, and I've been a pastor for over 30, for 30 of those years. And there's been lots of seasons where I've blown it. And it's just like, Lord, I'm just going to help you out a little bit here. Yeah, you know where I'm going, right? But there's been other times where I remember the outcome of when I tried to help him out and how it delayed something because I messed it up. There's been other times where I've just said, okay, God, you got this. And I'm going to wait on you. And I'll tell you that the outcome of those two different responses is huge. It's huge. I love Psalm 46.10 that says to be still and know that I am God. There is something that happens in our relationship with the Lord when we trust him to not take matters into our own hands. To not try to control outcomes. Because friends, the reality is you and I can control nothing. It's just the illusion of control. Only God can control outcomes. And so when we trust him... It's an exercise of faith that God responds to. It doesn't always work out the way we wanted it to, but it does always work out according to his will. 
And usually, after enough time goes by and we look back on it, then we're like, yeah, that was a better way to go. Yes, God, you knew right on that. And so that's what we've seen in this entire story and how it plays out. And then Pastor Brandon, he'll take you home next week. Now, I know we've covered a lot of ground, so let's just review real quick. That you and I are in a process of being conformed into the image of Christ, into his character, that will then produce a quality of life that is far different than anything that we can generate on our own. And so how that happens... That's another sermon, but suffice it to say, how that happens is a result of us being with Jesus. Character is formed by those that you are with. It's more caught than taught. And what it looks like, what this, char- what this godly Christ-like character looks like is exactly what we've seen here. And these are just five of many things. They're different facets of the diamond. Godly initiative, courageous faith, loving kindness, personal integrity, and patience. The five Christ-like characters that we see in the lives of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz in an extremely difficult, tenuous situation that hopefully will inform our own walk with Jesus and our own process of transformation. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, just giving us some very clear examples in Scripture. And this morning, specifically with Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz, that really help to Uh, unpack specifically what it looks like as we are in this uh, transformation process in this life to become more and more like you. And Lord, it's my prayer that we would recognize that this is what you want for us, that these are the qualities, Lord, that you are forming in us, and that we might not be resistant to these, Lord, but would be fully open to you doing what only you can do in the midst of circumstances, the difficult circumstances of this life. And Lord, that you would help us to trust you and wait on you in faith. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.